amazing YouTube video with you. Uh, this video, I filmed it a while ago and uh, I haven't gotten around to editing it. It's been a busy summer. We'll definitely be making videos on that as well. Uh, finished my first year of work. All that stuff is good. I'm gonna edit this out. So it wouldn't even matter. Um, so I'm just gonna continue rolling. Yes, in this video, I present to you Yeshivish Ashkenazi culture. Now, when I talk about Yeshivish Ashkenazi culture, there are many angles to look at it. And in fact, there is no one Yeshivish Ashkenazi culture. There are many, many, many different types of Yeshivish Ashkenazim. Definitely not trying to put them in a box. Um, I think that First of all, when I'm making a video like this, what I'm trying to do is create a sense of understanding to create a little bit of a sense of uh, just familiarity and, and compassion to help people really uh, connect, to bridge the gaps. And um, I feel that even within uh, our own communities, we can sometimes feel like we don't understand that type of people. And that's harmful because, uh, I don't know, that's not, awesome because <laughs> I don't know what the right words are that's not um that's not ideal you know we should be understanding each other and we should be um yeah feeling feeling like one in this uh journey we're all on together but anyways so when talking about Yeshiv Shashkenazim uh I think it's important to note that a lot of sort of differences that you would say between Yeshivish communities kind of lies uh within these ideas of like Mesora and Hashkafa. So just to briefly explain those two concepts, uh, Misora is how we've understood our religion from generation to generation. So to have a Misora means my rabbi taught it to me, his rabbi taught it to him, his rabbi taught it to him, so on and so forth, back to Moses, basically back to Moshe Rabbeinu. So that's what a Misora is. So different yeshivish communities have like slightly different like misoras based on like the rabbis and the challenges of the past generations and uh, what certain people focused on at different times in different areas. And in essence though, I still feel that a lot of the stuff in the video that I said still basically applies to the majority of the communities. Um, each different community may have a different idea of what to focus on and different like Ashkafa. Ashkafa means philosophy and they have slightly different outlooks and, and focuses. So uh, that's basically what that means. I think it's important to say that the Yeshiv Shashkenazi community is a community of values. There's a reason why they do the things that they do and the ways that they do it. There is a very, very, very strong tradition uh, with a purpose, a purpose of getting closer to God, the ultimate meaning, the ultimate sense of eternity and having a clear understanding of like what is my purpose being here and how can I best uh, be me in a sense in order to achieve uh, this connection to this higher power um, and it's something that is deeply embedded within the community and why they operate and why they function and how they structure their families and we have specific ways of understanding how to get close to God based on the uh, based on Harsinai, based on uh, the fact that we had received the Torah uh, on Mount Sinai, uh, which was, you know, this public revelation, which, you know, we, we had passed down from generation to generation. Ways that we're connecting to God is through uh, Shabbos or Shabbat. It's through learning. It's through being nice to other people and doing what's called chesed, meaning generosity, and through tzedakah, which is uh, giving to, uh, to others in need. And through doing those things, we sanctify human nature and are able to connect with God and essentially infinity and, and meaning. And I think within the culture, not everyone is so attuned to this philosophical orientation. A lot of people that, grew, that are yeshivish grew up yeshivish, grew up in that society, and they don't necessarily appreciate uh, the values behind what they're doing, necessarily. They, they might know it, and some of them work on it very heavily because there's also... Uh, the idea of Musr, which means to, um, to it basically means self-improvement, and it basically means meditating for a certain time of the day on aligning yourself with uh, what the right thing to do is, with what God wants you to do in life, and uh, there's a strong focus on that. So a lot of them are attuned to, you know, building a sanctified life, 
and uh, very heavily. And and meanwhile, a lot of them are just not. They, they were just, you know, they grew up this way. Learning Gemara is like normal. They did that with their father, and they learned it in school at a young age. So they don't necessarily have the same appreciation. They have to work on it to be able to develop an appreciation. And uh, yeah, and, and all of them pretty much you know, put their money where their mouth is. You know, people in the yeshivish circle are, uh, you know, they're they're learners. They they take it seriously and they, they really believe in it. And this is what the community uh, tries to produce, tries to push people to do. And they do a good job at it typically. And I think like when it comes to Sephardim, who typically are not yeshivish and don't go to yeshivas, when you have a Sephardi guy that does go to yeshiva, it's not somebody that's like coasting by and uh, just doing this because this is how they were raised. It's somebody that actually really believes in it and they take it very seriously. And typically, like you'll find that the Sephardim and the yeshiva are amongst the most sincere, serious guys there. Basically, uh, like we discussed in the last video, Orthodox Jews believe that there is a strong tradition of how to understand and interpret the Torah, which was written in the Gemara. And generation after generation, the study of Gemara has been very important for producing rabbis. Eventually, there was this yeshiva movement, and basically today, it's very common for people, once they graduate high school, to attend a full-time yeshiva. What they do in yeshivas is literally all day, from 7.30 in the morning to 11 p.m. at night, roughly that time. You know, each, each yeshiva might have a different schedule. But roughly from that time, there are prayers and learning Torah and Gemara specifically. Why that's important, why that's done, is because the Torah, as we said, is divinely given, right? And the oral explanation of the Torah is the divine way of understanding the Torah, which was also divinely given. And basically understanding how to take the word of God and put it into action is how we basically understand God and what God wants from us. So to be able, and, and God's thought process basically. So to be able to learn Gemara and master it and master the thought process behind Gemara is to basically think more like God, if that could be thought of. So that's basically why there is such a strong emphasis. It's, it's basically called Das Torah and gaining a knowledge of Torah and gaining an understanding of just how Hashem thinks and what Hashem wants from us. So it's very important and yeshivish Ashkenazi people put a very strong emphasis on learning daily. Even if you're not going to become a rabbi, even if you're working as a computer programmer or whatever you're doing, you should have some time in your day where you are learning Torah. You should be in yeshiva for as long as possible because that will set the foundation for your life and orient yourself towards what is the right thing to do. So that's that's basically why they do that. Even in a vacuum, learning Torah is considered a, a huge virtue. And like we said again, these people are not spending all day reading the Bible and uh, the, all the books of the Bible. They're spending time learning the, that oral interpretation called the Gemara. So that's what's put a heavy emphasis on. And specifically, men do this. Women, it's not seen as their role to learn Gemara. More they have uh, other types of roles. Often within these communities, uh, women's role is viewed as being able to maintain the house in order to make the sacrifice so that their husband is able to learn uh, for as long as possible until basically like needed. And typically people stay in learning until they're 30 and then they will go become a rabbi or a teacher of Torah or get a different job. And in other communities, it's becoming more and more accepted to stay in learning even past 30 and not even to necessarily become a rabbi or whatever, just to stay in learning because that in itself is viewed as beautiful. Now, to emphasize, women in this culture and community view that as a privilege, typically. They view that as awesome to be able to support someone in growing in Torah and learning Torah and, and things of that nature. They typically enjoy that role of being able to support the house. Okay, so then also within the community, you have different, uh, there is also a slight range. Uh, typically, you're not going to have anyone in the yeshivish community that doesn't keep Sabbath, that doesn't keep kosher. Anyone like within the community that hears like, what, like that person doesn't keep Sabbath is like, like, like that's a shocker. You know, um, you know, even not keeping kosher like one time, it would be like a huge shocker. And uh, the community is very religious. Within that, you do have a spectrum of like people on the left of the yeshivish community will read secular books, they will listen to English music, um, and some will even watch movies every once in a while, but people will typically like keep that quiet, um, depending on how left of the yeshivish world you are. 
Um, you know, to the right of the yeshivish world, you have people that will only wear white shirts and black pants. They'll wear their hat and jacket everywhere, you know, even if it's not pristine. And they'll never, like, listen to English music, like, God forbid, or, uh, you know, to watch a movie or even, like, think about watching a movie, like, anything like that. No English books, you know, and, and typically that's the range there. And the dress also is typically button-down shirt and presentable pants, presentable shoes, and that's the dress code. And the reason for that is because we view the human being as being an upstanding, glorified being. We're not just animals, uh, like a lot of, like what, I guess like in atheism, it might preach that we're like animals or whatever. But, uh, you know, in, in yeshivish circles, it's like, no, the human being was created for a reason and for a purpose and it's sanctified and it should dress accordingly. So wearing things like graphic t-shirts and jeans or whatever is just like, no. You know, I typically will dress in the summer um, or on off days, like if I'm having, if I'm doing an activity, like of course I'll, I'll dress according to the activity. But typically I do not wear shorts um, or uh, tank tops. I wouldn't wear tank tops really. Maybe if I was just working out, I would wear a tank top. But, um, you know, typically I would never wear tank tops outside. Like even short sleeves, like like no, it's not considered tzinius. Um And tzinius is another very important concept to talk about. Tzinius basically means dressing modestly, dressing appropriately. Um, on women, that means wearing a skirt that reaches below the knees. And, um, you know, in, in that's like in the left wing circle, like typically like up to the knees is like the most left a yeshivish person will go. Um, all the way on the right, women wear skirts up to their ankles. And, um, you know, they'll only wear a long sleeve. Like they, they definitely will not expose the elbow. Um, by men, um, yeah, if a guy's wearing short sleeves, nobody's like going crazy about it. But technically, even for men wearing a short sleeve shirt, uh, you know, uh, it, it should really, it, that's like considered kind of like inappropriate. Like, you know, a person on the right of a yeshivish uh, circle would not wear something that's above the elbow. And women definitely, like even in left-wing circles of the yeshivish community, women will not wear anything above the elbow or above the knee. Also like bright color red is considered also uh, not so tznis to wear. You know, I will wear a red tie typically, but um, you know, you're not really supposed to wear anything that's considered too loud or too immodest or anything of that nature. So uh, that's kind of the community. Women, when they're married to the left of the community, they wear wigs. Um, even most of the right of the yeshivish community uh, still wears wigs uh, because women are supposed to cover their hair uh, because once they get married, it's... I don't exactly know all the laws. I'm not like a rabbi, but, um, you know, once somebody gets married... Uh, a woman's hair is, is considered sanctified and she shouldn't just be like showing it off. So typically they cover it and uh, you're allowed to cover it with a wig because the idea is you're just supposed to cover it. However, there are many people that don't allow wigs because it looks like human hair. So uh, they typically will say you have to cover it with like a head covering of some sort. That's not a wig. The head covering itself could be a very beautiful head covering, but it shouldn't look like human hair. And that's, that's uh, the argument on the other side. And logically speaking, that makes a lot of sense. But the point is, is like, there's nothing inappropriate about hair. Single women don't have to cover their hair. Like looking at a single woman's hair is not an issue at all. So as long as it's covered, meaning that's the point, it just needs to be covered. Uh, hair, like that look of hair is not considered something like immodest. Just to talk a little bit about the value of modesty and sinias in the Jewish community, it's that we are the children of God. You know, all people really we view as the children of God. And therefore, we need to be regal and present ourselves properly. There's nothing wrong with uh, being beautiful. And in fact, being beautiful is important and, uh, you know, possibly even uh, a need for many people. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the idea is we should be modest and we should be uh, beautiful in a way that doesn't compromise human dignity. Um, and that's kind of the value there. So I think some of the pros to talk about within the community is that people feel a sense of purpose. People know what the right thing to do is. You know, there's a very clear understanding. I'm not saying it's always easy to get to that sense of clarity, but like there is an understanding of what the right thing to do is. And when you don't know what the right thing to do is, you go and you discuss it with a rabbi. And that is a pro, and I'll discuss a con about that in a bit. 
But that is a pro. And the reason you discuss, a, discuss it with a rabbi is because, as we talked about before, a rabbi in yeshivish circles is not just considered a religious authority. He's considered an authority for your life as well. You need to go to a rabbi and get advice because a rabbi has spent many, many, many years sharpening their mind and aligning it with Torah values. So when you come with a personal life question, even as something like, where should I move, right? A rabbi who is going to be like familiar with the idea of like, okay, you're moving to this neighborhood. These are the yeshivas there. This is who you are. Um, and hopefully the rabbi will know you well. And I personally am very close with my rabbi. Typically they will be able to give you life advice that's like aligned with Torah values. So it's very important uh, within that, within a yeshivish community to have a rabbi that you're close with. However, at the same time, there are many yeshivish people that don't have that and it's unfortunate. And you know, they kind of just cling to who the greatest rabbi of the time is. And the fact of the matter is that rabbi, however great they might be, they don't have a relationship with you. And therefore it's like the advice they might give you is not, uh, you know, so tailored to you. But many people will argue like, no, it's more important to go to somebody that has a greater understanding of Torah and more alignment with Torah and, and our, the Jewish values. And they'll be able to give you a better answer of what God wants than somebody who maybe knows you better, but has less of a close alignment. Another pro within the community is that the roles are often very clear. Men know what they're supposed to be doing. Women know what they're supposed to be doing. There's a system for raising kids. And on top of that, the sense of community is just very tight knit. It's a very uh, warm and loving community. It's a community that definitely looks after its own and um, cares about each other in extraordinarily deeply. Uh, the charity within the community is just phenomenal. And uh, just the camaraderie and companionship within the community is phenomenal as well. People are very close with each other. Generally, um, you know, they are they are very close and uh, it can be very easy to have your family friends and to, to make clicks and to feel connected uh, as a community and as a people. So I think a con within the community, and I'm not, I don't think this applies to everyone at all. I think a lot of people um, can sometimes sacrifice what they view as common sense in order to and, and kind of like pass up what they think the right thing to do is and just go to a rabbi. And this is not idealized in Judaism. You know, I've heard my rabbi say like this, that's not the idea. That's not what you're supposed to do at all. You are really supposed to develop your own uh, mind and your own sharpness to have Torah value so that you yourself know what the right thing to do is. And, you know, of course, you could always go to a rabbi for extra advice, for extra alignment, uh, if, if you're not 100% sure and if you're conflicted, but really you are supposed to know what the right thing to do is. That's always been the philosophy that's been passed down to me from my rabbis. But there are those within the community that it just becomes easy um, to pass up. I don't want to have to think about what the right thing to do is. I'll just do what the rabbi tells me to. And that, that's not ideal. And it does exist just because, like, there's like a certain fear of doing the wrong thing and um, it's a very uncommon issue, but it does exist. And like, just to give you a brief example, um, this isn't the best example, honestly, but um, you know, I, somebody asked me, I'm a therapist and you know, I had a conversation with a friend who's in yeshiva and he asked me like, oh, what do I think is, is more productive for a person? to go to the rabbi or to go to a therapist for, with regards to helping them in their life. So I said like, look, I think rabbis are amazing. You know, I, um, especially when you're close with your rabbi, you should always have somebody that you could get life advice from and, and mentorship from. I think that's incredibly important. I would never put that down. Um, but if the person has a real issue, you know, something like a, a real uh, mental health concern or uh, just they're feeling overly stressed and, and they just need support from a mental health therapist or whatever, um, I think it's it's very important and, and more productive for a person to be able to go to a mental health professional uh, to actually deal with the issues because a lot of the time, like even if the rabbi has a lot of knowledge of your specific issue, when you speak with the rabbi, you don't have weekly sessions with them and you work on what you guys did and talked about. It's it's like you speak once a month with him or every time you have an issue come up, you know, you speak with him and, and typically rabbis are very busy. They don't have like the ability to do like weekly sessions with you. But a mental health therapist, on the other hand, like, and we're talking about, of course, a competent mental health therapist and a competent rabbi, you know, um, a mental health therapist who's going to have a lot of knowledge on your issue. He's going to know how to help you get through it and uh, whatever. 
Now, this guy started arguing with me. Like, how could I say that a mental health therapist will be more productive for a person? A person should always go to the rabbi. And I'm like, I'm like, I couldn't even understand where this person was coming from. Whatever, I'm not, I'm not presenting the argument so fairly because the way I also said it, I kind of like triggered him. By the way, that is not the sentiment that's ever been expressed to me by any rabbi. Any rabbi will tell you that like somebody who's going through something real, or even if not, you just, you know, you have, you feel like you need some extra emotional support and some extra therapy, definitely go to a therapist. Any rabbi will tell you that. Any competent rabbi worth his salt, that is. Okay, so also another thing is that within the community, it can often be viewed as second best to go to college and to get a job, as opposed to being in learning and becoming a rabbi or, or a teacher or something within uh, the Jewish community. And that I think is unfortunate. I think that, uh, you know, the real backbone of the community are people, uh, are of course the women of the community that really hold up the community, the wives and the, the single women that are making a sacrifice, a serious sacrifice to try and uh, and uphold the community. But then aside for that, it's the, the donors, the people that are actually working, that have businesses, that are really upholding the community financially, that are really making it even possible to have in this day and age yeshivas where so many people are able to sit and learn. So I think it is unfortunate that a lot of people in the community do view it as second best, but uh, whatever, that's the reality. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Comment, like, subscribe. Yes, guys, future videos, I'm going to do Jewish dating very specifically, and I didn't add Ashkenazi Yeshivish dating because when I do a video on my own personal dating experience, I'm going to go in depth into that. Uh, and yes, very exciting future videos planned so please subscribe and stay tuned and hopefully we will continue weekly videos over the summer i've been extremely busy i've taken on more hours at work and lots of really good family news so uh i hadn't had uh, the ability to really put up videos but i did have time to reflect on how i had been making my channel so far and uh yeah I'm, I'm excited to continue and be back on the scene and post consistently but uh thank you guys